Hi, I'm Brad, and I made this entire presentation while wearing this thing. Meh. So at the beginning of this week, Valve actually released a brand new SteamVR beta. And usually when a big number jump happens, there's a little things to look through. A good data mining session. And as always, me and my peeps, as I like to call them, just now, uh, actually did go through all the files and try to see what we can find. And this video is pretty much summarizing everything we did find and some mm, speculations on what they might mean. If you enjoy this content or any content like that, I do not like to take sponsors or anything else. So every support you give, whether it's a like, comment, or subscribe, or even going to bradsmells.com slash Patreon, it allows me to keep doing this. So if you appreciate my content, I appreciate money. So let's hop in really quickly. Uh, for a while since we've been starting doing these Deckard and SteamVR data mines, we kept finding references to something called Prism. In fact, I just did a huge hour-long almost recap video of everything we did find in the past one and a half years a couple of weeks ago on this channel. If you want to be summarized, I might be referring back to some things in that video or, you know, I, I can't cover everything Deckard uh, might be in this short video, so go to that one. But anyway, uh, Prism is something that we kept finding strings to and it wasn't until probably this beta update that we got some clear indications of what Prism might actually be. Prism first showed up in January uh, of last year with all the other Deckard strings, so we do know this new system is compatible with their new headset. So this video will be all about SteamVR Prism. Well, a big chunk of it. And I have this cute little tagline that Beta 1.25.1 shines a light through it to give us a hint on what it is. Or maybe. Disclaimer, as always, these strings are real and were added uh, in the back end of Steam VR, mostly all in the Lighthouse drivers, but we'll get to that uh, very soon. But of course, uh, a lot of these interpretations of what they mean are speculation and you should treat them like that. Until Valve actually announced Deckard, pretend it's real, but not confirmed. Got it? So more recently, in the past two big updates, starting with 1.24.1, which is like last month, and then this month with 1.25, we're seeing Valve is adding a lot of different strings to kind of indicate that a display of maybe a future headset or any headset that is using Lighthouse or tapping into those Lighthouse drivers would have these different sort of flags to tell a certain spec. For example, uh, 1.24 had HDR10 support. If a display could actually show off HDR10 in some manner, then they can activate that. Or if they're DSC supported and there's a version of DSC that they need to use for those displays. They also added a bunch of that in the last big patch. But in 1.25, they actually went even way further going on with some kind of new uh, specifications that a display might have. And I want to first talk about this first one that is called display underscore multi frame rate. Now, there's been uh, a little speculation on my side on what this might actually mean. Multi frame rate is kind of different than the actual setting flag that is currently used for setting a refresh rate or frame rate for a display. Um, that is called display underscore frequency. And of course, that's only to set it at one frequency. And usually, most headsets, you have to restart SteamVR for it to take its effect. So, this display multi frame rate is very different from that. And I actually do think that Valve might be looking into variable refresh rate displays. Now, this is not a surprise. Uh, I do believe that a lot of people might know what variable refresh rates are and the benefits they give. The best examples are NVIDIA G-Sync or on the AMD side, FreeSync. And it basically allows you to eliminate screen tearing when a GPU cannot keep up with the frame rate that is required at a standard single frame rate. Um, it also saves battery if you are lowering it at the lower frame rates during the range, it, it, a lot of different benefits. Um, but the issue with a variable refresh rate for VR is because a display is running at a very low duty cycle, around 10% of the time usually is what most of these companies go for, there's a flickering effect that would happen uh, if you kept having a huge range, a random range, I would say, of frame rates per different frames. Uh, Valve actually has a patent that shows that they were going to solve this by dynamically adjusting the brightness, the constant brightness of each frame to sort of solve this. Um, I was pretty skeptical of this actually happening until I went to SID uh, this year and BOE, which is a major, um, mostly LCD, but they are switching to uh, OLED as well, manufacturer, and they even had a demo of a variable refresh rate uh, displays in a VR system to show that they figured it out, at least the demo, which may have been smoke and mirrors, but who knows. 
I think this would be the most likely case of what that multi-frame rate would be, since Valve has clearly published patents and done a lot of things to show it off. Um, also, that display I've been talking about for so many different videos, um, that, that micro OLED, I believe they partner with a micro OLED manufacturer for the military in the USA. Um, they released a 2K by 2K display, and it would actually supported variable refresh rates back at that time. And it seems like the 4K by 4K display is taking a lot of the design uh, ideas from that 2K and just kind of getting them bigger with some more features such as uh, lower dower needs outside of the center window. It wouldn't surprise me if this display also supported a variable refresh rate too. Now there's also some other strings that weren't really related to a uh, sort of display spec. You wouldn't just turn it on or off. But these were um, things related to setting subpixel shifts what are subpixel shifts? Well, I kind of did some research on that. So subpixel shifting is a very common thing used in OLED and LCD displays, um, especially for LCD stripe. Um, usually if you don't do this sort of subpixel shifting, you'll see a lot of aliasing or just ugly text um, if you don't have any subpixel shifting going on. And basically what happens is usually they turn on or like set certain red or blue, usually it's red or blue pixels around text, for example, to turn on slightly so you get more of a smooth rounded view uh, when you're directly staring at text all day. So you don't get this weird old blocky like low resolution stuff. It's just a way to make things look clearer. This might be especially useful if they do something called counter rotation, which I'm going to talk a lot about in later in this video. But uh, this thing, which is the Quest Pro, is one of the headsets that do counter rotation of their display panels. And I will tell you, the text anti-aliasing looks really bad sometimes in rendering. And I'm wondering uh, if there's just not much uh, leeway to do a lot of this subpixel shifting within the headset or whatever they're doing. It's just not good enough. So it's very important, especially when you get into these clear lenses. You're going to notice these, uh, the, the, these sort of aliasing of pixels and edges way more. Now, this is where we start talking about actually Prism. Uh, there were some new strings which sound very exciting to me because we've been dying for strings that just hint to us what Prism might actually be. And we got some here. So there's something called a prism correction, which you can enable for what seems to be the left or right eyes. And it's to the point where it will even do something when you turn it on, it will override a loaded device JSON. Now, this is really interesting. And I probably have never talked about uh, device JSONs very much on this channel. So I'm gonna give a first a, a little explanation of what that is. So if you buy a Valve headset, for example, um, you, your headset actually has some actual JSON file loaded onto it. It will, uh, it's usually done at the factory. So if there's any factory calibration going on there, maybe the displays are not just perfectly set. So they do some little sensing with cameras or something, or maybe the, uh, the gyroscopes or all, all these I, IMUs and stuff, they can, uh, set a file to sort of tinker with all those values to make it work best when the user just gets it at home. Usually you don't have to mess with this file. In fact, it's really hard to kind of get into that file or download it. There is a way to do that using the Lighthouse console, which I posted here, but you should not actually do this, uh, download or upload configs unless you know what you're doing because you'll break your HMD. But yeah, that's basically what device JSONs do. It's just trying to tweak, uh, give all the parameters, the, 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 the serial numbers, just a lot of different things there. And what's interesting about this prism correction is it seems to completely ignore that factory JSON, or even overriding it completely, which is very different than I think Valve has ever done with any of their software. So I started wondering why would Valve want to have the ability to override that device JSON? Well, let's talk about these uh, strings that popped up as well. Now, there's a lot of strings related to uh, setting a panel's cant, which is, I did a lot of different pictures here. You're gonna see some video of what canting is. Um, Basically, the index does a little bit of canting. Uh, it, you make the displays, the edges, horizontally uh, tilt toward you. But they, um, not very new. Index does that. Not a big deal. Um, there was also the old strings of uh, panel clocking, which I believe is definitely the counter rotation. Again, the Quest Pro does this. It allows you to rotate the displays uh, toward the inside. Uh, benefits might be giving better FOV or even just uh, more nose gap space, a, a few other things going on there. But some other interesting ones I never thought about before until I saw these strings is Valve is also adding debug options to set a panel's pitch. Now, there's also some pitch degree strings added here, so it's not 
related to a pixel pitch. It's related to the actual pitch of a display, which is a type of rotation where it's either rotating it uh, the top toward you or the bottom toward you, which is very different. I don't think there's any headsets I know of do this. Um, and I was kind of asking around what might be some benefits of that. And basically it might be like giving, edging out some more vertical FOV, maybe on the bottom on the sacrifice of uh, higher up FOV. Maybe if you are a VR chat nerd and you like full body tracking and you want some more presence, well, if you were able to edge out that bottom FO, uh, that bottom tilt a little bit to see your uh, virtual body even more on a general basis, that might be more immersive of a situation for you. Or it might be the opposite way, where they want you to see the skybox, uh, the skybox more often. A very beautiful sky view. Just tilt that thing up at the sacrifice of your bottom FOV, and that seems to be the main uh, benefits of doing a panel pitch. So Valve is at least experimenting with that. And of course, there's also the set uh, subpixel stuff, which I, again, I do think that's related to the subpixel shifting. But the interesting thing is there seems to be uh, also a, a, a set amount of degrees, which I believe might be the, the rotation or something, that they can set the subpixel shifting to correlate with any rotation that happens within the display. If you were to pretty much set all of these at some random value, uh, doing all the canting, the counter rotation, and sort of the the, the pitch, this is pretty much what you'll end up with. It looks kind of strange. Um, I can't imagine it in my brain on what it would look like in a product, but this would be the best way to edge out as most FOV from all different directions uh, with smaller panels and thinner optics, which I know people care a lot about FOV. And if they did all these things, we'll see what happens. So Valve also has a ton of patents related to counter rotation and also canting the actual panels that are counter rotated. Here's the view on the right. You can see the top view that's just a counter rotated panel and the bottom uh, right is the canted with the counter rotation to get just a ton of FOV. Um, the one interesting thing is the top left one or the top right one uh, that doesn't actually cant it. They say if you leave it just counter rotate with no cant, at least you can get the lens closer to your face, which will improve the center of gravity and make things more comfortable. But if you didn't care about center of gravity as much, the idea was there'd be another configuration that you would be able to cant the displays. And of course, there would be a point of uh, balance a little bit lesser than that top view of the 302 we see in this patent. And then I read this little tidbit of this patent that made my brain go crazy. Uh, we're going full on tinfoil mode. And basically, they explain that the orientation and pa position of the panels could be obviously just fixed, not adjustable out of the factory, um, which is just common. Every headset does that. But the patent goes on to say that they were thinking about the idea of allowing people to adjust the canting positions, the rotation, the canting of the actual displays if they wanted to. And they talked about both axes, which would be the pitch and the actual canting that would be found in the software strings. I have no idea if they would actually give the user the ability to do this, but when you think about all these strings that allow you to set and adjust both of these things, and they also have this prism correction that seems to be all about setting up the displays to override all these out of a manufacturing lines uh, standard configuration, maybe Valve wants to let people mess with that a little bit? I, I don't know. Maybe that's why they also expect people to mess with the top strap even more to where they're not really reliant on velcro but they want to have an entire pulley system designed purely for that top strap because people are going to be adjusting it so much because they're going to be adjusting displays to rotate certain ways and pitches to make things more comfortable and maybe that's what jeremy salon who is very big on the actual display side of the vr team maybe that's what he meant on making hardware more like software or maybe I'm just crazy as normal, which is always true as well. But let's just get out of Prism. Again, I really do think Prism is related to overriding the device specifications, uh, basically depending on what you set the IPD, uh, the, the, the rotation. These might all be things that Prism is designed to do. Prism it basically calculates based on maybe eye tracking position or all these other um, rotational values that you have set for the displays and lens housings. And the prism, with some very intense math, sets the panels to work with that. Maybe. Again, tinfoil hat could be true, could be not true, but kind of fits in my brain, even though it sounds crazy and like an engineering nightmare. So to continue out of prism, let's talk about HTC just a little bit, because Valve made a 
big mistakey here. Um, so I actually have a video coming that will leak pretty much everything you want to know about HTC's uh, constantly teased headset. It is a consumer headset, and I like to call it the Flocus 3. But I will not talk about it until that video is done. Uh, but Valve is trying to spoil that video already. So all these things are OpenXR flags, um, or really different OpenXR systems related to HTC, all their extensions. And they're all related to their upcoming headset. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it, but all these OpenXR uh, strings are actually not even in the public OpenXR specification. So this was, uh, Valve doesn't only care about leaking their own stuff, but they uh, are leaking their partner's stuff too, which is pretty funny. Again, I, I will just say all this stuff here, uh, they're not using Lighthouse drivers for the next headset. So all the other stuff I'm talking about related to Lighthouse drivers does not apply for HTC's next headset. So just in case you were wondering. Uh, there was also some shader reworking going on, uh, just a lot of stuff deleted and re-added, and it seems to have affected the actual way when you uh, pull up the dashboard or any overlays in a SteamVR app. It seems to completely remove that darkness, which is supposed to hide the blur, uh, blur shader going on if apps want to actually render the, the app lower while you're navigating the dashboard. And I think the reason why they're doing this is because Valve seems to be banking heavily on the belief that their overlay system and even letting devs build uh, better overlay apps to work on top of their uh, VR apps, very similar to what you might have saw um, Oculus Remote Desktop working in VR apps. They seem to be trying to support that and make those things better and more usable. I don't think people want to have things darkened if they open up the dashboard to access an overlay or something. So that's why I think why they might be doing this. Um, they also made the text a little bit bolder and deleted the older text that made things look thinner. Again, don't know why they might be doing that, but they're just changing things around a little bit in the UI. Uh, speaking of allowing overlay app developers to actually do a little bit more things, this is what the, normally the uh, SteamVR dashboard desktop mode and like any windows you create with the desktop mode, they have something called a control bar, which is um, on the bottom here. You can see it allows you to adjust the size, uh, pull up keyboard, activate night mode. That's what they're using for their own desktop uh, experience. But they added some strings to allow developers, or at least at one point allow developers, to actually en enable this control bar for their overlays uh, hand-built as well, which allow you to close the control bar, open up a keyboard. Very simple things, but... I, I do believe that uh, someone at Valve is very interested in just building out their overlays as much as they can. There's also some new references to allow the Sky Dome, which uh, I haven't talked about Sky Dome in a while. I still don't know exactly what Sky Dome is. It seems to be some new feature set or maybe something related to room view or something. Um, but you can allow it. It might also be related to the theater mode as well. But for now, uh, you cannot actually allow Sky Dome, even though the textures, as you can see in this short video, do exist. And you can set those textures to be weird SteamVR backgrounds, but they don't fit correctly. We also have a spatial encode mode. I don't know. <laughs> it's spatial encoding, spatial computing. I don't know. And finally, in the Lighthouse drivers, we have some new OpenXR inputs that are not related to the Valve Index Knuckles. They don't use any of these ones that are highlighted in green, which is very strange. I don't know if they're going to be doing some new controllers with XY buttons or what. And um, yeah, the joystick in uh, the Index Controller joystick is called Thumbstick with the OpenXR flags. So this might be just something generic that they leaked into their Lighthouse drivers or... They are working on uh, the Index 2 or Deckard controller configurations with OpenXR. No clue, but just wanted to end off on that. Not really. I actually wanted to end off on my Omega patrons. Thank you to all these people here who give me $25 a month to do crazy, crazy videos like this one. Um, I don't have much else to say. I'm just very thankful for all the support I get on this channel and maybe other social media such as my Twitter. It's just a lot of fun doing this, and I'm always happy to do it. All right. Next video, HTC, probably. Once that 3D render gets done of the headset. Bye.